So chapter one, verses 15 through 23, here we go. It says, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. This is Paul talking to the church at Ephesus. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which you have been called, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. Do you understand why I'm excited to preach today? Listen to what's being said here. This is insane. According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and all authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fits all in all. In the kingdom of God, there is always more in Jesus. Let's pray. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word and that your word is enough and that I could have just read this and we go home and God, you would do a work that is beyond our wildest dreams. And so, God, we just thank you that your word is alive and active. And Holy Spirit, you're already moving in here. I'm not inviting you here. You've been here for a hot minute, and you're doing awesome things already this morning. But, God, we just want more of you. Holy Spirit, we want more of your presence. We want more uh, awakening. We want more revival in our hearts right now. So, God, I pray that each heart that is in this room realizes that, God, you have more for them right here, right now. Regardless of how they walked in the door this morning, regardless of what they're going through or wrestling with, regardless if they feel good in their relationship with you and they're hungry for more, regardless of if they don't know you, maybe for those of us who are stagnant and stale in our faith right now, God, you have so much more. Like we can't even get that. We don't even understand that, but God, you have it. And we want it because you want it for us more than we want it for ourselves. So God, we just ask that you would give it away that you would open up the floodgates this morning, that you'd overwhelm us with your presence, overwhelm us with your love and your grace. Yes. We want more of you, Jesus. Not so we can boast in ourselves, but we can boast in you and you alone. And that as we get more of you, that we give it away to the world who desperately needs it. We trust you, Jesus. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. If you walk away with nothing else this morning, hear this. In the kingdom of God, there is always more in Jesus. That's the summary of this text. And, and here's the thing. Here's, here's a sin that we have often settled for, even as Christians. It's the sin of settling. It's the sin of actually settling for less than what God has for you. Like if we're really honest this morning, we, we could all confess that the sin that maybe we walked in here with today is the sin of settling. Like, like maybe some of you in the room have just settled for salvation when God wants to actually heal you completely. Like maybe some of us have settled for, okay, I'm good with God now, but I need to walk through this life feeling really guilty. Maybe some of you have walked in here today and said, well, like I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to get to heaven one day, but I'm going to be miserable on my journey there. Maybe you've settled for that. And I just want to encourage you today that the cross bought you more than that. Like what Jesus has done for us in, in his work and what God the Father has done in his provision and what the Holy Spirit has done in sealing us has actually bought us much more than just settling. And so if you're like me and, and you've at times been guilty of settling in your faith, I and mean, I just, I just want to encourage you today. I don't want to condemn you. I don't want to beat you up. I just want to put before you the offer that Jesus has, which is he has more. He has more grace than you have capacity to sin. <laughs> Do you realize that this morning? He's got more grace than you have capacity to sin. And by the way, you have a lot of capacity to sin. <laughs> that just proves how much grace he really has. In the kingdom of God, there is always more. And so Paul really wants the Ephesians to get this. He's, he's talking to this really interesting church. We've talked about it. This Ephesian church is kind of a hodgepodge group of people who some were Jews and some were not Jews. And then God's like, hey, I'm going to bring you together. You have nothing in common except me. And so I'm going to use you to fall in love with each other and change the world. <laughs> And so that is the church who he's talking to here. And he's been telling us this in incredible kind of poetic declaration that we read the past few weeks about what the Father has done for us in salvation, what the Son has done for us in salvation, and what the Spirit has done. The Father has provided a way. 
The son has uh, redeemed us in his blood and the spirit has sealed us with his promised Holy Spirit. And so we get to the end of that, which is interesting because the way Paul typically writes in a letter is he opens up and then he prays for the church. But, but to the Ephesian church, he opens up and then he gives them this incredible declaration of salvation and, and all that God has done. And then now here we are in verses 15 through 23, where Paul begins to pray for the church. But he wants us to keep in mind everything we've talked about the past three weeks, because he's referencing that within his prayer. And, and what Paul wants the Ephesian church to get, and this is why he starts with that declaration we spent three weeks kind of picking through, is because he wants them to understand that God has more for you in Jesus. There is more, there is more, there is more. This church would have already experienced crazy things. This church would have, just how it started was a miracle. The way these people got together was crazy. This wasn't a church that was just stale and stagnant and, and Paul was coming in like, hey, you need to get up and, and start to live a little. No, this church was alive and active and healthy. And Paul gets in there and says, hey, he still has more. And I, I wanna encourage you to say, I believe this church is alive and active and Jesus has more. And so, man, it, this isn't the message just for those who are feeling discouraged, although it is. It's for those of us who feel like, man, God has us in a really sweet place and we're good with him. He still <laughs> has more. And I say that because Paul prays with great expectation for more for the Ephesian church. That's how he prays. This, this prayer that we're diving into, you see Paul's heart kind of on his sleeve. It's fully out there for the Ephesian church to see, hey, God wants more for you. And so I just want to encourage you today, the way you pray shows what's important to you. The way you and I pray to God shows what we value. And so Paul is so concerned with this Ephesian church, understanding that Jesus has more for him, that he, he literally prays into that. And so we're just going to spend some time today looking at how Paul prays and really how we're called to pray for ourselves and for one another. Now, I love that Paul is praying this for the Ephesian church because this gives us insight as to really Paul's heart for them, God's heart for them and also God's heart for us and how we should be towards other people. If you've ever wondered, like, I don't know how to pray for people or I don't even know how to pray for myself. Man, this text right here gives us some clear understanding of what it looks like to pray for ourselves and to pray for those around us. So how is Paul in Jesus calling us to pray? Well, let's look at this text. Verse 15 says, for this reason, for this reason, he's referring back to everything that he talked about that the God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit had done in salvation for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So the first thing that we learn about how do we pray is we, we give thanks to God for what he's already doing. We give thanks to God for what he is already doing. See, see, one of the temptations that you and I could have this morning is as I declare that God has more, we could neglect the fact that he's already doing enough, right? He's already doing more than enough for us. And so what Paul wants us to make sure we understand that we get our ducks in a row today, that we, as we ask God for more, because he promises to give it, we don't neglect to thank him for what he's already done. We don't neglect to give him thanks and praise for all that he's already provided for us in the person and work of Christ. And so Paul takes some time as a good shepherd, as a good pastor to this church. And he says, hey, I just want to thank God for all that, that I see in you. And what does Paul see? He gives thanks to the Ephesian church or to God for the Ephesian church that he sees that they have faith in Jesus, that they have faith in Jesus. And we can kind of read this, right? And be like, faith in Jesus, that's good. That's a no brainer. That's kind of what it means to be a Christian. And yet if we're, we're honest this morning, the same struggles the Ephesian church have, we have today, right? Like, we have a lot of people at times who claim Christ, claim to be Christians, right? And don't really have faith in Jesus. Maybe you and I, if we're really honest this morning, can we be real and, and honest this morning? It's one of our core values, like being real. Like maybe you and I have walked around with faith, but it's been not in Jesus. And, and so what Paul is seeing that the Ephesian church is getting right amidst some of the other stuff that they got that's broken, you have faith in Jesus. And so, man... I just want to encourage you, like, th that is good. That is something that we should celebrate. That's something we should marvel at and something that we should be encouraged by. But what is this idea of faith? And faith is such an interesting word, right? It's, it's, it's kind of the crux of Christianity, really. It's what it's all about. It's faith. But what does that mean? 
Because one of the things that, that's happened within the church is we've taken this word faith and we've kind of elevated it to a place that's unhealthy or we've had a misunderstanding of what faith is or we've kind of said, hey, if you don't have enough faith, God can't love you or save you or heal you. And that's just not biblical. So what is faith? It's a lot more simple than we often define. I love this definition. It's a great reliance upon. It's just really being desperate for something and throwing yourself at it. That, that's what faith really is. It's not this super spiritual word we often think it is. It's actually a very practical word, although it has very real spiritual implications. Faith is looking at something, realizing you're desperate for it, and going after it. That's all faith is. Let's not overcomplicate it to something that's unattainable because Jesus brings it to us so close and so real and so tangible that we can taste it and see it and we know it's good. That's what faith is. It's a great reliance upon. It's believing, receiving, and resting in. Like, like that's just a simple way of helping us understand how are we supposed to have faith in God? It's believing in God, not believing stuff about God, but believing in him, what he's done for us, his love for us being put on display in his son, Jesus, believing in him. And it's not just believing that he did that 2000 years ago for those people. No, it's believing and then receiving it for ourselves. It's believing that what Jesus did 2000 years ago is so real and tangible for us today that we receive it and we make it our own. And we realize because he's made us uh, his own that we can belong to him and make him our own. It's believing and receiving and then resting in. Do you know that the journey of faith is resting in the presence of God? That's got to heal somebody today. Like, I just believe it. Like, I believe that somebody is in here right now and you're like, I've just been white knuckling this thing called faith my whole life. But really, you need to understand that faith is just resting in God. It's not being lazy. It's not being apathetic. It's, it's resting in him. And I promise you this, that when you rest in the presence of God, it will set you on fire in a way that you would not believe. It'll cause you to work harder for the kingdom than you could ever work in the flesh. It's believing, receiving, and resting in him. And here's another thing. Faith is not so much about how much you have, it's what you have it in. Someone else needs to see this this morning. Some of us think like, I just need more faith. I just need more faith. I, I just don't have enough faith in God. It's, no, it's not about how much you have. It's what you have it in. Where is your faith this morning? Like, I really want to ask you that question. Where is your faith this morning? Because Paul, as a good pastor, notices something unique in his church. Your faith is in the right place. Your faith is in Jesus. And they, the, the, the Paul, as a good pastor, celebrates that. Thanks, God. You have faith in Jesus. Their faith was not in their stuff. Their faith was not in the government. Can I get an amen? Their faith was not in their health. Can I get another amen? Their faith was not in the world or their jobs or their friends or family, their money, their looks or abilities or intellect or even the church. Their faith was in Jesus. Where is your faith this morning? Because if it's not in Jesus, I just want to lovingly encourage you, it will crumble at some point. Some will last longer than others, for sure. But if your faith is not in Jesus, it will crumble. And when it crumbles, it will be devastating. And so the offer on the table this morning is that you can put your faith and your trust in Jesus and him alone, who, who cannot, not only will he not, he cannot fail you. The moment Jesus fails to be Jesus is the moment he fails. The moment he, he fails to hold you up is the moment he fails to be himself. He cannot fail at being himself. Where is your faith this morning? Because it's not so much in how much you have. Because one of the things that we could get discouraged in is we could see other people's faith and be like, well, I just want to be like them. And that's, that's healthy to some extent. Like God uses that. But if that becomes an idol, that's a problem. And so what God wants us to see is, is what he, Jesus actually says, hey, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell mountains to get into the ocean. Like, that's crazy. Have you ever thought about that for a moment? That seems wild. Jesus isn't just being exaggerant or extra like some preachers do, right? He's not. He's being real. And he's saying, hey, faith, the size of a mustard seed, you can't see a mustard seed. It's that small. But it, what Jesus is emphasizing, it's not how much you have. It's if you have it in me. Like if you just have a little faith in me, I can do more than you could ever ask or imagine. And, and here's the reality. Jesus wants you to have more faith today, but he also wants to make sure it's in the right place. Is your faith in Jesus this morning? Because I promise, regardless of how much you have, when it's in him, it changes everything. And I just want to encourage us for a moment, like, we're a church that has faith in Jesus. And I'm proud of you as your pastor. Like, 
Like for real, I, I've talked to you and I've heard some of your stories and I've seen the, the struggle and the grind and the heartache and some of the, the things that, that life has put you through. Maybe some that you put yourself through a little bit, right? If we're, we're honest. And you have faith in Jesus. Although like the world has like beat you up one side and down the other, you have faith in Jesus. Like I'm encouraged to be your pastor today because you have a faith in Jesus that is encouraging to me. Like as I talk to you guys and I hear your stories, like it encourages my faith. And I feel just like, Paul, I relate to this because I see that you have faith in Jesus. I'm just so encouraged. But if you're in here today and you're like, I don't, I don't know what faith in Jesus looks like. I don't really get that fully. And man, I, I just, I, I want this, man. I want this faith. I want it to be in Jesus. But what does it look like? Let me give you a picture. And God has a way of using my kids in ways that I never thought he would. And so when I think of faith, I literally think of my two little girls. And I think of what it looks like when we go down to the lake uh, at my, my in-laws. My father-in-law and my mother-in-law have this awesome lake house. And, and they have this dock on the lake. And we go in there and we swim a lot. And what my girls love to do is they love to stand on the dock. And they love to run and then jump into my arms while I'm sitting in the lake. And I love that, that when this first started happening, and in fact, it's been a while now, so the next time we go down, they'll be a little timid at first. But what they do is they kind of put on their life jacket. And, and I look at Hadley because Hadley's a little less timid than Kingsley. But Kingsley gets there because she sees the faith in her sister. Man, there's so many, so many crazy cool things there. Anyways, I digress. So I'm sitting in the lake, like in a, like a, you know, a life jacket. I'm like, come on, come on, come on. And, and they're like, I don't know, it's kind of cold. I don't know, yada, yada. And, and they kind of like stand on the edge with their toes on the thing and they look like they're gonna fall. And I'm like, no, 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 like jump. I got you, I got you. Trust me, I've got you. Daddy's got you. Daddy's not gonna let you drown, I promise. I know that one time I almost dropped you, but I'm not gonna drop you, I promise. Like, I got you. And so at first they kind of like get up there and, and then they like, they whine. Like if you've been around my kids, you're like, uh-huh, yep, they do that. So they look down and they're like, daddy, I don't know. And I'm like, baby, I got you. Just look at me. And they don't jump. They like, they fall. It's ugly. <laughs> it's awkward. It's weird. And I like, I'm like, they bunk my head. I'm like, if you just done it right, like I would have got you, but you made me not get you because of you. Like, you know, but it's weird, right? But then what happens is they, they have so much fun. They're like, I want to do that again. And so I get them back out of the, on the dock. And then literally two hours later, they're running, jumping, and they're like spread eagle out on me. And, and it gets to the point where then I don't even have to catch them because they're like, oh, th this life jacket's got me. Like, daddy doesn't have to catch me now. I'm, I'm good. And what I see is two little girls who they're not, they don't have a care in the world about what's going on around them because they trust me. Like, faith doesn't require you not having doubt, by the way. Like some of us are in here and think we can't have it. We don't have enough faith because we have too much doubt. Like, no, faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is trusting in the midst of it. And so, man, can we just be more like Hadley and Kingsley? Like in our bathing suits, not caring in the world what, you know, how awkward it looks as we dive off the, the dock and just trust that our father is going to catch us. Because if I am going to catch my kids, how much more is God going to catch us? That's what faith in Jesus looks like. Let's run. Let's jump into his arms. So Paul, like, guys, I'm not even halfway there yet. All right. So Paul, <laughs> I told Chandler last night, I was like, this is going to be an hour and a half sermon. Uh, and I was kidding, but maybe I'm not. Um, so he celebrates their faith in Jesus. Their faith's in the right place. But he doesn't stop there. He says, in your love towards others. Your love towards others. And Paul's like, man, I'm just not going to stop. I'm, I'm going to increasingly thank Jesus for your love for others. And here, here's what we need to hear. This must be. Not it should be, although it should be. It must be the mark of the church to have love towards each other. And Paul's specific talking about the, the love that they have within themselves. He's saying, hey, you've got it right. You have your faith in God, not in each other, and your love is for one another. And he's saying your love is in the right place. You are loving people. This is also not optional. Like, one of the things I think we believe sometimes is this, is like, well, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. That's not an option on the, on the buffet plate. Sorry, it's just not. Like, you can't love God and not love the church. And God's going to love you if you don't love the church, but he wants you to love the church. Like, that's part of his design. He loves the church too much for you to just drag it through the mud. And so he wants us to see that, man, we're supposed to love one another. It's not optional, but it's also not supposed to be forced. That's what makes this love so interesting. Is yes, it's, it's a mandate, and, and dare I even say a requirement of us to love one another, but it's not just like, oh, I have to do this because we're Christians. That's not at all the heart that God has for us. No, he wants us to literally like fall in love with one another and to like supernaturally blend together in a way that literally doesn't make sense. 
Like, like the type of people that, that were in this Ephesian church would have literally nothing in common outside of Jesus. And yet they, they loved each other and had a bond in a quicker amount of time than any other social construct could have. Like the blood of Christ is thicker than the blood of your family. And so what happens is when you belong to the family of God, like it's real, it's tangible, it's, it's not optional. And so Paul was celebrating that they had love for one another. And here's the thing, it's a supernatural type of love and it's a love that God delights to give us so we can give away to each other. So, so here, here's a practical question I wanna ask for us today is, how can you, you individually, as a part of the, the body of Zeal Church, how can you take a step towards loving someone in here today? Like, oh man, I'm going to have to love somebody today. Yep. <laughs> like, I, like Holy Spirit convict right now. <laughs> like what is one thing you can do today before you leave this place to, to tangibly love somebody in this room? Because I want us to love York City and I want us to love the broken and I want us to love those people out there, but we're never going to do it if we don't start loving people here. I'm just convinced of that. Like we, we are foolish if we think we're going to do something out there that we're, we're not doing in here. So what can you do today? to love somebody in here today? Is it, is it having a conversation? Maybe it's a hug. Maybe it's, it's actually not hugging somebody. There's a lot of people in here who, the way you could love them is to not hug them. I, I've learned that. But do you know them well enough to know they don't want to hug? <laughs> like, how can you love somebody in here today? Because this is the mark of the Christian life, faith and love. Faith in Jesus and love for others. Jesus tells us, he says, hey, the world will know that you're mine. Like, let's stop for a moment. If Jesus says that, we should park up and listen. Jesus says, the world will know that you are mine if you do a lot of social justice, if you pray harder, if you read your Bible more, if you come to church more. Nope. If you love one another. That's how Jesus promises, declares, puts his seal of approval on it. He says, the way you choose to love each other is how the world's going to know you belong to me. If we want the world to know that we're we're Christians, that we belong to Jesus, that this kingdom culture is real for us, is how we love each other. And then how that bleeds out into how we love the world. And I want to encourage us today that these are not mutually exclusive things. Faith in God and love for others aren't two things that we just need to pick aside and work harder at. It's the same thing. Like if your faith is in Jesus, you will love other people. It's just the natural overflow. You may not be as good at, as, as it, good at it now as you will be in five years. However, like that is the mandate. That is the call. That's what it looks like. It, faith in Jesus looks like love towards others. And once again, I feel Paul's heart here because I believe us here at Zeal Church, we do this well. And I've talked to countless people who've come here for the first time. Like, I, I've never felt love like this. Like, like literally people who are like, man, I, I want what you guys have. Like, I, I want to smoke what you're selling. Like, that's, that's where I'm at. Like, I want it. And like, what, why is that? Well, because we're choosing to love each other and we're choosing to love those who walk in the doors. And I just want to celebrate, like we're doing it well. We are putting our faith in Jesus and we're loving others well. And here's the thing, he has more. He has more. But Jesus, we just thank you right now and we celebrate. God, we celebrate like Paul celebrated the Ephesian church and we thank you that you are making faith happen here at Zeal Church. And that you're, you're allowing us to love each other People who, who don't have a ton in common outside of you, Jesus. People who have different personalities and different ways of living, different backgrounds, different struggles. And yet, God, you have allowed us to love each other well here. And I'm just so thankful. We just praise you and thank you for all that you're doing. And yet we expect you to do more because that's all you know how to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, let's continue. Verse 17. That, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Like, that's just a really pretty word, like phrase, sentence, like that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. That's, that's what Paul is praying for you and me right even now. Like he wanted that for the Ephesian church. That's what Jesus wants for you and I right now, that the eyes of your heart right now would be enlightened. Holy Spirit, we, we trust you right now to do it of wisdom, or I'm sorry, having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. So here's the second thing we pray about. We ask God to give us more of himself. We ask God to give us more of himself. We should never ask him to give us other things before we ask him to give us himself. 
the best thing, the greatest thing God could ever give you, regardless of your financial situation, your, your, your uh, relationship status, how, how crazy your family dynamic is, regardless of your job situation, regardless of your health, any of that. The, the greatest thing God could give us is more of him, more of himself. He would be a really terrible God if he chose to give you what you wanted without giving himself. And sometimes he doesn't give you what you want because what you need is more of him. And he knows better than you and I know that if he gives you what you want, it's going to actually lead you farther away from what you need. I just want to encourage you today. God's not holding out on you because he's stingy or mean or a jerk. He may be holding out on you because it's the best thing for you. He may be holding out on you because he's waiting to give you more of what you need and really more of what you actually want in him. So we need to pray. We need to expect God to give us more of himself. Paul has this expectation as he's praying. Not, it's, this, this hope that Paul's, Paul has is not kind of like that hope that we have on Christmas morning that, oh, I hope I get what I wanted. No, it's this hope like, God, you're going to do it. Like, just come on with it. Bring it. Like now. Like, I'm ready. Like, he's confident. It's an expectation. It, like, Paul's expecting God to do something. So much so that he's leaning into it with his prayer life. We need to ask God to give us more of himself because everything we need flows from him. And, and look at specifically how Paul is praying. Look at who he's praying to. He, he's asking the spirit of God, the spirit of God, Holy Spirit to show up and do some stuff. He's asking specifically that Holy Spirit would enlighten and, and give insight and understanding of, of who God is. Do you realize this morning, it doesn't matter how well you know the book, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church, it doesn't matter how hard you pray, if Holy Spirit doesn't enlighten who God is, you will not know him. So Paul knows that the best thing for us is more of Holy Spirit, to illuminate the word of God, to give us the true understanding and context of it so we don't misuse it or abuse it and use it for things that it was never intended to be used for, but that we can use the word properly, that we can understand God more fully and more intimately. It's, it's only Holy Spirit that can give us insight in Revelation, but he wants to do that. He, he wants to do that this morning. Do you realize that? Like God wants to, for all of us, like unleash understanding and insight and knowledge for us today. Like let's pray that God would do that. Let's pray that God would give us more of himself, more revelation of who he is. But once again, I love this, this phrase that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that they would be illuminated, that, that our hearts would be able to see God more fully and more clearly. And I love that he says the eyes of our hearts, not the eyes of our minds. It's not the eyes of our minds. It's not more intellect. It's not more Bible knowledge. It's not more Bible studies. It, it, it's more connection with him in our heart and our soul. Because that's when it's going to change the, the head knowledge. And it's not this lofty, like weird, kind of mystic type thing. No, it's that your heart would be able to understand, oh my gosh, God loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me, to pay the penalty for my sins so that I could have access to God, that I could no longer be a sinner, but be a saint. I could be a son or daughter of the most high God. That's the type of knowledge that God wants us to understand. Not just up here, but in here. So much so that it affects everything about us. It's one thing to know that you belong to God up here. It's a whole nother ball game for it to get here. Because when it gets here, it changes literally everything about you. Everything. Like we were in here earlier this morning praying kind of as a, as a team. And, and uh, Miriam, where, where are you at? Miriam, I'm just going to call you out, girl. Because she's like, she literally goes, ay, 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 I can't stand it. I just got to shout for joy. That's literally what she said. That's what happens when it gets here, not just here. You literally can't, can't keep it to yourself. And man, it just exploded in the room and we all felt it because we're like, man, that, that's what God does. He shows up and he gives more. And look at what Paul is saying that he wants the eyes of their hearts to be enlightened too. It's not stuff. It's not more possessions. Look at what it says. There's three things specifically that Paul's like, hey, Holy Spirit, I want you to help them see this. Man, Holy Spirit, I just want them to get this. I want them to, to feel this in their bones, in their hearts, in their inner being. It's this, the hope that he has called us to. The hope that he has called us to. The word hope means this, an eager expectation, an eager anticipation. Hope is an eager anticipation for something. So, so what is Paul wanting the Holy Spirit to reveal to us that our hope is, the hope that is in our calling? It's that he's coming back. It's that Jesus is coming back. Like, I, I don't know if we understand this, but when Paul and the people of this time like talked about Jesus coming back, they believed it was happening in their lifetime. Like they believed it was happening then. And so their lives were projected that direction that, hey, he's coming back. Like not someday, but like maybe today. They lived as if he was coming back then. 
And that was, there was a hope that it stirred within them that, that allowed them to literally be bulletproof in that world. And although they died, they're like, you can, you can separate my head, but you can't separate my heart from Christ. Like, you can hang me, but you, you can nail me to a cross, but don't do it like you did my Savior. Like, I'm not that worthy. Like, they had crazy audacity as they were being murdered for the name of Jesus. Why? Because they had a hope that no one could rip from them. It was a hope that he was coming back. And that one day, no matter how hard it got here on planet Earth, they were going to be with him in paradise. All the saints who have suffered before us are home with him right now. They're sitting at his feet. They're resting in his loving arms. They're being shepherded by a good shepherd in a way that we long for, a way that we were made for, in a way that will be ours one day. See, here's what hope does. It calls you out of something and into something better. See, this, this is what Holy Spirit wants us to understand, that, that God is calling us out of some things. There's some things that, that are still in here that, that as we are walking through this journey that God wants to call us out of and maybe call out of us so that he can put new things into us, that, that he can call us into new things. And he wants, to go, he wants us to go from people who are, who are walking in addiction to walking in wholeness. Like he wants us to go from people who are walking out of apathy into passion and zeal for the Lord. Like, I don't know where you're at this morning, but I do know this, that there's something he wants to call you out of and call you into, and maybe something he wants to get out of you so he can put something better in you. That's what he does. That's what our hope does. It, it brings the revelation of what's happening for all of eternity. And that we will be with him forever, church. Like, forever is a long time. And it's a lot of time to be with our God. But that's the truth. That's the honest to God reality. We will be with him forever. And what will we be doing? We'll be ruling and reigning with him. You know, part of your hope, part of the hope that you've been called to is to be a conqueror and co-heir with Jesus. So you're going to sit next to him and say, no, I'm going to rule too. Like the universe will be at your disposal. I love this quote and I shared it in small group. I said, I heard this. One of the problems with the prosperity gospel, which is like the name it and claim it, you can have everything now and that, that like God is going to give you everything you want. The problem with that is timing. God will give you everything you want. God will give you everything you need. You will have rule and reign. It's just at the right time. It's the next side of heaven. You'll be with him and you'll rule and reign. And the universe will be under your feet because it's under his. Isn't that amazing? Part of your hope is that you're, you're not going to be stuck in your situation here. You're going to be literally above it, ruling and reigning. You're going to tell stars where to go. <laughs> you're you're going to tell stuff what to do in the name of Jesus because you're going to be ruling and reigning with him. So the hope that he has called us to, the second thing is the riches of his inheritance. Notice that. Because when I read this the first time, I was like, oh, the riches of our inheritance. That's awesome. Like we got a lot of cool stuff in Jesus. I just talked about one of them. We get to rule with him. One of the other cool things we get in Jesus is you'll know the full Bible. Like not just know what it is, but what it means. Like we were talking about that in small group this week too. Like, like you're oh, like, cause we're like, I don't know what that means. And we're like, oh, one day we'll know exactly what that means. Like everything in this book, you'll know. There's a ton of stuff that comes with your inheritance in Christ, but Paul is talking about God's inheritance in us. So, so what Paul is praying is that they would understand the riches of God's inheritance. There's something unique and special that happens when we get revelation that God has an inheritance in and through us and that he's proud of us. Listen, listen to this. God has claimed Christians as his own possession. That's his inheritance. You and me as followers of Jesus are his, his inheritance. And he says here that there is riches within his inheritance and his possession of you and me. God looks at you and me as a part of his incredible wealth. Like when God is, is calculating how much he's worth and cal calculating all the stuff that he owns, you know what's at the top? You. You. You know what he values? You know what he possesses and he's so proud of? You. Not even just us. Like it's us, yes, but it's you. Like you need to see it as you today. That he values you. He is so proud of you today. Like somebody walked in here this morning not believing that. Like feeling God, like you couldn't be proud of me. God, you don't know what I've done. Yes, he does. <laughs> He knows what you've done more than you know. Do you know God's forgiven you for sins you're not even aware that you've sinned? Like you and I are guilty of sins we've committed that we're not even, like we didn't remember doing. We didn't know we did. God knows it and forgives it and says, you are mine and I still value you. You still have worth in me. You have extraordinary value placed upon you because of the blood of Jesus. 
The blood of Christ says you are valuable, that you are priceless, that you are worth more than you could ever fathom. And there's something that happens when you believe that. There's something that happens when the Holy Spirit illuminates that in your heart. What it does is it, it leads you away from finding your value and worth in other things. And it leads you to finding your value and worth in Jesus. This isn't just something that you could feel good about yourself. It's very practical. You see, if you understand that you have value and worth that comes from heaven, you don't need it to come from earth. You don't need it to come from relationship. You don't need it to come from the, the bank account. You don't need it to come from stability and security and, and health. Like you don't need it to come from the president. You don't need it to come from a, the, the, whether or not you have corona. Like you don't need it there. Like you need it in him. And when you have it in him, it doesn't matter what this world throws at you. He wants you to be enlightened to the value that God has put on you because you are his. Do you believe it this morning? Do you receive it? This morning, do you know the worth of Jesus in you today? Because there's more than you could ever ask or imagine. And this isn't just something that, that today, if you choose to believe it, then you have it. It's something you already have that you need to be aware of. See, all these things that Paul is talking about, it's not stuff that, that is, you know, will be yours if you choose to have it. No, it's yours. You just need to understand that it's yours. Like everything I'm talking about today is not just for some of us who are the spiritual elite and some of us who choose to believe it. This is for any of us who put our faith in Jesus. It is yours. Do you understand you have it? Some of you are living on an incredible wealth that you don't even tap into. You are living on billions upon trillions of valuable riches in Christ and you don't even know you have them. I just believe Jesus today wants to remind you that they're yours. Hey, you're sitting on a, a landmine of wealth. You're sitting on a valuable spring of living water. Do you believe it today? Because it's yours. It's yours. And then the, the third thing that Paul prays for them, the greatness of his power to be put on display. The greatness of his power to be put on display. I love how he words in verse 19. This is just, gosh, this is so good. Like the, the text here is just so good. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Like, come on, let's just get more adjectives on here that just talk about how great this is. The immeasurable greatness. Like it's great and you can't even measure it. The greatness of what? His power. Like those are three just dynamic words. Like the immeasurable greatness of his power. Mic drop. I'm not going to drop the mic because it'll break it. But I believe that's kind of what Paul would have done. Is like, just like, let that sink in. The immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. Like he, he wants to give this to us who believe according to the work of his great might. So God wants to put his greatness, the greatness of his power on display. I love this definition of power. Someone uh, who's way smarter than me wrote this and I was like, I'm gonna steal it. I'm gonna give you credit, even though I don't remember who it was. It's probably an old dead guy because I read a lot of old dead guys. But he says, <laughs> power is this divine, dynamic, eternal energy. Divine, dynamic, eternal energy. Like that's what God wants to put on display in your life. I don't know about you, I want that. Like, I, I want that in my life. I want that in your life, but I want it in mine too. Like, I, I want that to be what people feel. I think that is what people feel when they walk in this room and when they start hanging out with some of us, right? They feel this thing that they can't necessarily put words to. I, I don't know what it is. Y'all are different and maybe kind of weird, but I want it. <laughs> I want it. It's this divine, dynamic, eternal energy that, that God possesses that he desires to put in and through us. See, God desires to put his power on display in your life. And the power at our disposal in Jesus is outrageous. It gets outrageous. The power that God wants to show in and through you is insane. Like you, you wouldn't believe it if you even had a taste of it. And yet it's yours. It's yours. And do you understand something? That God gets great pleasure at showing off how awesome he is to you and me? You want to know something that, that God just gets joy and gets happy doing and, and pleases him? Like we often have this view of God as being this kind of like angry stoic God sometimes, right? Like he's just smiting everything. Like, no, no, no. Like God gets pleasure. God has fun. God gets happy. Put other words to it if it helps you make, make it make sense to you. Like he gets happy. Like he gets giddy. He's jumping around and having clapping his hands when he can put on display how awesome he is in your life. Like he gets joy at showing off in your life. Like it's what he wants to do. He's not over there questioning like, ah, well, maybe if I can squeeze it in between, you know, nine and, and nine thirty today. No, like he has more of it to give you than you could ever ask. 
he wants to put it on display. That's, that's really all he knows how to do. And his power is actually made perfect in your weakness. See, some of us need to hear this this morning because I, I think for some of us, we believe that like, okay, God can, can display his power in my life once I get it in order. Or once I get everything aligned. Or once I believe this better about him. Or once I become more like whoever. No, you know the secret ingredient to God flexing his muscles in your life? Your weakness. Like your weakness is the secret ingredient that, that makes God's power look great and awesome. Now what I'm not inviting you into is just to be more sinful. That's not what I'm inviting you into. But what I'm inviting you into is to not allow the, the weakness that you have to keep God from putting his glory on display because he promises literally in the Bible that my power is made perfect in your weakness. Will you allow your weakness to show his strength? Some of us need to, to quit hiding some of the scars that we have. Some of us have been beaten up. Some of us have, have life has thrown us a punch or 20. <laughs> and what we do is we come into context in circles like this and they're like, man, it's just too wild and crazy for some of these people. If they only saw the scars on my arms, like if they only knew the wounds of my heart, if they only knew the wounds of my soul, like it would freak them out and they would run. But what God wants to do is he wants to put your, your wounds on display, your, your scars on display to show that healing exists. You know, the point of scars is to prove to the world and prove to you that that, that, that wound is, is healed up. Yeah, it's a little more sensitive. Yeah, when you touch it and poke it, it, it kind of hurts a little bit, but it's, it's healing, it's whole. Some of you, and, and me too, we, we have wounds and we have scars that God, God is begging for us to put on display to one another so that we can be the hope and the, the divine power that God flexes to show someone else in this room that, that healing does exist. Like, like I've heard some of your stories and this has been my reaction every time. I just want to lean in more. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I'm, I'm hurt there. You, you've received that healing? Well, tell me how. Like, I want more of it. Man, what would happen if we would just get real and honest with each other? I'm not saying be reckless. And I'm not saying just, just dump all your baggage to every person here because that's not healthy. But I am saying get to know people in this room. Become family with people. Where you're, hey, hey, this happened to me. Hey, I, I'm wrestling through this. Like, I, I met someone this week, and I'm not going to say who it is, who their, their story is so eerily similar to mine that, that I, literally I've never met anybody whose story is as close to mine. And I'm sitting there having coffee with him for three and a half hours. And I walk away and like, my soul is healed in a way it's never been. Why? Because we were able to open up and we were able to confess and we were able to talk. And, and he's like, hey, have you ever questioned this? I'm like, oh my God, yes. No one else has ever had the same question as me. He's like, how have you wrestled with that? I don't know. And he's like, me neither. And so we wrestled together for like an hour of that three and a half hours. And I'm like, oh my God, he's so good. He's healing right now in real time. He's putting his power on display for us to see. And we walk away and we're just like in awe. We're dumbfounded. We're, we're literally marveled at, at what God is doing. Like that's what happens. But it requires us to be a little vulnerable. Church, are you willing to be vulnerable? Because until we're willing to be vulnerable, until we're willing to put faith to jump off the dock, you can't experience the healing that God has for you completely. Will you be willing to show your scars so that the world can know healing exists? And I believe the way God desires to flex his muscles and to show his power the most is through his grace. Through his grace. grace there's something about grace that is literally so powerful, so good, so rich, so incredible that God is willing to allow a lot of other crazy things to happen in our life so we can taste that grace is that good. I believe that with all my heart. So part of how God wants to put his power on display is through grace in your life. Grace that looks at your sin, sees the mess of it, sees the brokenness of your life and doesn't ignore it and wipe it to the side, but grace that sees your sin and actually does something about it. I mean, that's power and that changes. I mean, this power can do some things. Like, like I, this may be weird, but if, if you feel led to, close your eyes right now and, and let this wash over you. Because this is what the power of God can do. Because I believe this is for us today. Someone needs to hear this, that the power can heal. Like the brokenness you're experiencing right now, that power can heal you. Not partly, fully. It can heal you right now. And it can start a journey of progressive healing that, that one day you'll stand before him completely healed. But that journey can start today. Like that power can heal you. That power can redeem your story. Now, some of you know you had a calling on your life and you did some really stupid stuff and now you're questioning, can God still use it? Absolutely he can. 
In fact, not only can he, he wants to. He would get a lot of joy out of doing that. In fact, he has a PhD in using brokenness to be redeemed and restored. That's, that's his specialty. He can and will and wants to redeem your story. He can restore. Like some of you are like, man, I, I, I had this joy of the Lord and I used to love being around him and now I just, I don't know. It's just stale, it's stagnant. I'm kind of like distant. I don't really know if I feel like this way and I kind of feel guilty for not feeling this way. Like, like he can restore you. He can restore the joy of your salvation today. Not just when you die and go home to be with him. He can restore it today. That's the kind of power we're talking about. It can bring joy. Some of you maybe had joy and it's been stolen from you or maybe you don't even know what joy is because you never tasted it or maybe you so long for it that you see it in others. Joy can be yours today. It can destroy strongholds. Some of us, some of us have been wrestling with things like our entire lives and we feel like we'll never beat it. We'll feel like it'll, it'll never fall. Like the tower's too high, the base is too wide, the roots are too deep and I'm here to tell you that all God has to do is snap his finger and a stronghold in your life can be taken down in an instant. That's the kind of power. God doesn't, by the way, his power, he doesn't have to exert a ton of energy to show it. Like the stronghold in your life that you've been trying to kick for like 20 plus years, like all God has to do is like, boop, <laughs> like that's it. He just pushes it. He doesn't even have to touch it and it falls and is crumbled and destroyed. And that's not because the stronghold is weak. It's just, he's that strong. He wants to destroy strongholds in your life. He wants to liberate you. He wants to lift weights and chains off of you. And some of us have, have had chains removed from us by the blood of Jesus. And then we, for some weird reason, keep putting them back on our shoulders as if we look more holy by, by weighing ourselves down with all this stuff. And God's like, no, that's not for you, my son. That's not for you, my daughter. I don't want that for my kids. I don't want my kids to have to carry around weight heavier than them. And God wants to lift those weights and keep them off you. He wants to make you glad and happy again. Like, like one of the things, weird things we do in Christianity is like, well, God doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be joyful. No, he wants you to be both. Like he wants you to be happy. Like the worst thing this world could have is a bunch of miserable Christians. Like he wants happy folks. He wants people in this room. Last week I was like, man, this was so much fun. Church should be fun. You know how church is fun? Happy people are here in church having fun. <laughs> yeah. And some of you, like we, we laugh, but some of you are like, I, I can't be happy. I don't know how to be happy. God can give you a happiness today. And it's not superficial happiness. It's happiness that comes through him and his presence. I and mean, he wants you to be happy today. He wants to give beauty for your ashes. <laughs> he wants to take things that in your life that, that maybe you're a victim to, or maybe that you didn't deserve to happen to you, or maybe that you willingly walked into. And you look at now and you're like, God couldn't do anything from this. There's nothing for him to do anything with. And he wants to take that, that, that heaping pile of ashes and, and birth something beautiful out of it. He, he doesn't want to just move it away and, and, and give you something new. No, he wants to take the ashes and give you something beautiful out of them. So when people look at it, they're like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. That's, that's, how, how's, that, how's that possible? Because my God specializes in taking ashes and making them beautiful again. He's that specific in how he shows his power. And he wants to make all things new. He wants to make you and I new. And he's, he's committed to that church. Like if you're not committed to your holiness, be, be assured of this. He is. He is committed to your holiness. He will not return until you're at your proper form of holiness. You will not be called home until you're at your proper form of holiness. God is committed to his holiness in you, regardless of how you feel committed to it. And my hope for you is that as you realize how committed God is to your holiness, that you participate with him. And you join him in that endeavor. And this is the type of power that, that the enemy has no kind of match for. Like, like the enemy has, is, is no match for this type of power. I mean, the Bible tells us, that, like, it's death, where is your victory? You realize how taunting that is to our enemy? Oh, death, where you at? That's it? That's all you got? That's all you got? That's cute. Like, like, that is the, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? Do you realize the devil has been defanged? Yeah. Like he cannot hurt you anymore. Like, like it may sting for a moment, but it will not be permanent. And really what happens is when he tries to throw your past in your face, you can just remind him of his future and your future in Christ. And that really frustrates him, by the way. He doesn't like it. I'm not saying that he's just going to like, oh no, like, like no, he's going to kick back, but you just keep throwing in his face what belongs to him, which is 
not you. And his eternal damnation in hell and that you belong to him in victory. That you belong to the Lord. That you are his. His power wants to be put on display in our lives. And are we praying for this? Like Paul is praying that the church would, would understand the hope that they have in Jesus. Paul is praying, man, that they would begin to taste and see that he is good, that they would begin to taste and see his power. He's praying that the church would understand how valuable they are to God. And are we praying that this would happen for us? I pray for you, church, that you would understand the, the hope that you've been called to, to help you weather the storms of life, that you would understand how valuable and precious God sees you as, so you don't have to look for your identity in other places. And I pray that you would begin to taste and see how, how powerful he is so that you could be used by him to put on display through your weakness how great and mighty our king is. I promise you I'm getting to the end here. Verses 20 through 23. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Let, let, let's stop here for a moment. He's about to tell us how really his power has been most fully put on display, the, the most incredible display and depiction of God's power ever he's about to describe for us. Now listen, verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Like that's really good. And that's only 20, and we got three more verses, y'all. Come on. <laughs> Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Like, he's leaving no room for you to put anything else here. Like, like he's above it all. He's, a, he's a, above everything. Not only in this age, because some of us would be like, okay, so he was over everything then, but what about now? What about this election? What about this virus? What about all the craziness? What about all the racial tension? Listen, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Now, he is over it all everything. And he put all things under his feet. <laughs> like his authority, it's under him, it's under his feet. And he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and in all. So here's, here, here's the last thing that we do. We, we thank God for what he's done and we ask him to, to give us more, but then we praise God that he has power over everything. And this is what really like faith looks like. This is what surrender and submission and humility looks like. It's thanking him for what he's done, trusting and expecting him to do more and praising him and trusting him with the results. So what Paul does, he, he's diving deep into the souls for the Ephesians and saying, but let me remind you, he, he's already got it. He's already flexed. He's already put it all on display. He points them back to the cross. See, the power of God is most fully and clearly seen when Jesus rose from the grave. If you want to look at the power of God and wonder how it's true and possible, look at the gospel. The God in his infinite glory created us to be with him, to be intimate with him, and that we chose sin over him. And yet God was not content with us settling for sin so much that he became human, that he became fully God and fully man and lived in the flesh and lived to perfection. If you want know what perfect looks like, look at Jesus. In all of his thoughts, all of his ways, all of his teaching, like he, he performed all kinds of crazy miracles, turning water into wine, walking on water, telling storms to quit, like calm down storms. I'm, I run the weather channel now. I'm God. Listen to me. Like he took a, a boat that had that a fisherman who just were struggling, couldn't fit, catch fish. And he gave them so many fish that it sank their boat. Like that's not just a coincidence. That's God flexing his muscles. That's Jesus putting his power on display. And it really frustrated the Pharisees so much so that they said, hey, we want to kill him because he's not godly. <laughs> they wanted to kill God for not being godly. Isn't that interesting? And yet in the midst of killing him, what they real, didn't realize is they were being used by God to put on display the greatest work of power ever because Jesus died for our sins. He atoned for the punishment that we deserved. It's what grace does. It looks sin in the face and deals with it completely. And Jesus doesn't stay dead. He, he begins to show his power by resurrecting three days later, which once again shows us that sin has no sting. Death has been defanged and that we can stand in victory. It's in the resurrection that God shows his power most fully. Paul even says later on in his writings, hey, if Jesus is dead, we're wasting our lives. He says, hey, hey if Jesus is still dead, if he hasn't resurrected, if, if Holy Spirit really didn't get him out of the grave, Christianity is pointless. But Paul's so confident that that is true because he's resurrected, yeah. that he's alive, that he's living. And so this kingdom culture we're talking about is not some king who lived 2,000 years ago, who's alive today. Yeah. 
who has more and is willing to give us more now. So we just thank him for putting his power on display in the resurrection. But notice that that's verse 20. So not only has he resurrected, but he's then been seated far above all things. Far above all things. Let's look though in detail for just a moment above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. So literally anything you could somehow try to squeeze in there is covered in all of those statements. If you think that anything is a match for Jesus, can I just lovingly tell you, you are absolutely wrong. (laughs) Jesus outweighs everything. He is far above all things, not only in that age, but in this age now. And doesn't that just bring us some comfort today? Doesn't that just bring us some peace today and and some, some hope and some healing today to know that, oh my gosh, like as the world looks like it might shut down again, as we're not sure how this election's going and depending on how we voted, we're really happy or really not. Like as racial tension seemingly like started to look like something good was going to happen, but then we're not sure how it's going to work out. Like when our finances seem to be up in the air, when we're not sure how Thanksgiving is going to go because we're in the midst of a virus and we really don't like our family anyway. And so you put those together, man, it's going to be really hot, right? <laughs> like when life just is happening, that God is in control. And we often say things like the sky is the limit for God. No, it's not. He's above it. God is looking down at the sky. Oh, yeah, that's where I put that thing. (laughs) The sky's not a limit for him. He's above that. There is no limit for him. (laughs) He's above it all. And I love, in case we hadn't got it yet, he says, and he put all things under his feet. Like, feet are gross, y'all. Like, feet are kind of nasty. But, like, it's supposed to symbolize that, that that's the kind of power that God has. It's all under his feet. It's all under his rule. It's all under his care, under his protection. He's got it. And so if we're wondering like what God is up to, like this is supposed to remind us that we don't have to know because he's got it. He's good. He's in control. But then I love that that Paul is is a good shepherd again here and he's reminding the church and reminding us today that, that Jesus is the head. The father has given him as head over all things to the church. And I love that he begins to expound then on this, this incredible analogy of the body of Christ. Like the church can be seen as a lot of things, but one of the things that that mainly that God wants us to see the church as is the body. If you think of your body, like your body is so dependent and reliant on, like nobody looks at you and and starts naming off all your body parts. No, you're you. You don't look at my wife and just start, hey, Channon's face, hey, Channon's eye. Like, no, I don't, uh, you know, announce everything that's going on there. That's Channon. And she's got a body, right? And she's got a head and a face and all of this. And, And they're all working together simultaneously to be one thing. Like, they're so interwoven together that they, they, they are actually one. And there's a lot of intentionality that, that God puts in using the analogy of the body. It's close. Like, your body is close. It's literally you. It's connected and it's intimate. It's close, connected, and intimate. And that's the design that God has for us as the church, that we'd be close, connected, and intimate. And it's not up for grabs, like, necessarily who has the head. Like some of us are feet and some of us are legs and some of us are kneecaps and some of us are like, you know, I'm, I'm going to stop before I say something I shouldn't say. And so we're whatever, right? We're parts of the body. And some people are like, oh, I, I might be this or I might be that. Or man, I wish I was this, I was that. Here's what's not up for grabs. Who's the head? Jesus. And that's not just like to help kind of make the analogy look cool. No, it's very practical. The head is the command central. The, the, the thing that we look to to get every other order and every other thing is from the head. So as the body, we look to Jesus as the head. He is the command central for the church. Did you know Jesus is your boss? Jesus is your pastor. Like I I have the honor and privilege of being lead pastor here at Zill Church. I'm really not though. Like I am and I'm not. Like I am the lead pastor and Jesus is our lead pastor. Like if he's not pastoring this church, it will flop and fail. But he's the lead pastor here. And we reserve that right for only him. And he's our master. So what does this mean? It means we gladly and humbly submit to him. We gladly and humbly submit to him. See, here's just something really cool about being a part of this kingdom of God. It's better to be a servant in his kingdom than a king in our own. I love that. Like, it's literally, it's way better for us. We get a better trade-off if we're actually servants in his kingdom than kings in our own. We have more authority. We have more power. We have more rule. We have more say. We have way less stress and way less burden if we're servants in his kingdom and if we were kings 
in our own. So we gladly and humbly submit to him. So as a church, what we've learned today is that, that God has more for us. And so what is our call? Our call is recognizing the more and responding by thanking him. We recognize that God has more and we thank him for what he's already given. We don't want to neglect what already is and expecting what will come. So we thank him. We gladly thank him for our faith and our love, our faith in him and our love for others. And we ask, we ask with expectation. But man, some of us kind of ask timidly when we talk to God, like, God, if it's your will and if you would like to, maybe please kind of sort of give me this thing. But if not, it's okay. That's not the posture that God wants for you. No, God, God wants you. And it's gonna, let me just, it's gonna feel uncomfortable. You, you may even mess up in some things you say and God's fine with you screwing up as long as your heart's right, okay? But I, I just wanna encourage you that God has an authority and a power that he's giving you that he's expecting you to walk in. It's like declare stuff in the name of Jesus as long as it lines up with the Bible, right? It's asking God for more of himself. Like if you're asking God to reveal more of himself, you don't have to question if that's a part of his will. Let me encourage you, it absolutely is. So you beg God, you demand God to do that because that's what he does. And he delights in you asking him for good things. So we thank him and we ask him with expectation. And then we praise him. We praise him. We praise him for his power being put on display. Because all our God knows how to do is more. And church, I just want to encourage you again, he's not content with you settling. If you walked in the room and you've settled somewhere in your faith journey, he is not content with that. He's too good, too kind, too loving. His blood was too rich that was spilling from his side to keep you there. And he wants to move you from settling to healing, to wholeness, to rest and restoration and revival. Do you want it for yourself? And even if you don't, I promise you, he wants it for you. And he wants it for you today. Because in the kingdom of God, there's always more in Jesus. Citizens and saints of God.